But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Powerful scripture right there. Because we all go over this place where there's a temptation to doubt. That part where it said, sit you like we is a crazy thing, because shake your round. Shake your round. I've never seen, I've never seen nor read in any generation where there's more mental health issues. I've never seen that. And a majority of people who struggle with mental health don't even have mental health issues. It's just they've been misinformed. They saw something that was greater than what existed, couldn't process it, and didn't have anybody to bridge it into reality. Then began to be bombarded by information, conditions that aren't conducive to begin to evolve. And they've been diagnosed with something that's not appropriate for what's going on in their life. It's, it's, it's a powerful thing because if we can begin to understand that there's things that are happening in the spirit, means you can't see it, and there's things that are happening in the natural. And a lot of times we speak too quick to a situation and leave with, proper, with misinformed understanding. Be somebody saying something to you and it's not appropriate. So it doesn't properly relate. So if I say that you're not gonna be anything because you're only a young person, you can't do anything, you're not affected, I'm not speaking correctly. I'm not speaking correctly. And it's so important for you to realize that if somebody says something and it doesn't, so we used the word before at, at, the, at the, um, the camp, resonate. And resonate means that it doesn't really connect with what's going on inside of you. Resonate really means that it doesn't speak to the spirit that's really inside of you. It doesn't wake up anything inside of you. It doesn't challenge you to become bigger, better, and more effective than you have been. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Because that person is speaking from their condition, not about your situation. And a lot of times we walk away. It's amazing I find that so often in this world, we tend to speak and accept things that aren't, aren't, aren't our true lives. But it's because it's familiar. Familiar means that you're always hearing it. So you now buy into it, say, oh, it must, it must be just like what I've heard or I've seen before. But it's not true. If you can begin to open yourself up and adapt the word of God in a, word, in a way that is so practical, you can change the person who's speaking about you because they're speaking sometimes from fear. They're speaking as well from, from past experiences. They're speaking from a limited place. God speaks to us from an unlimited place. And he's calling us into an unlimited place. When we say the kingdom of God is in us, that means we have unlimited resources inside of us. That means there's no boundaries to what we can do outside of us. There is a process, there's a time and a season when we can do these things. There's a process that we can develop to be ready to do these things. But there's no boundaries of what we can do throughout the process of history. So when we look at this passage, you're talking about being, uh, it's really just talking about being tested. And when we get tested, we're tested in the areas of the, um, the temptations of our lives. Is it a pride of life? Are we desiring to be famous or known for some great idea? Um, that, I, that whole pride of life that is so dangerous because it causes you to be impatient. It causes you to be anxious for everything. Instead of waiting for a lifetime of work to define your name, you're trying to find your name overnight. You value being liked online instead of being loved by God. We begin to start doing things that cause you to live abnormally. You see, the powerful thing about going beyond the pride of life is because you start to discover the keys of life. The next temptation that we look at is really the, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. So is it really that you know, we're just looking out for our basic needs, we're just looking out, changing them, uh, those, those things that we want? Are we really going out just to seek some power in this world? Because Jesus too was tempted with these things. And he said, tempt not the Lord thy God. And when he did that, that's when the release came. When he took time to overcome the temptation, not avoid it, not deny it, not to indulge in it. When he took the time to overcome the temptation, that's the power. When you take the time to incorporate the word of God when you are tempted, you will not, not only overcome that day, but you overcome for the days to come. You have the power to now bring back a word, a confident word, that you can now bring back your brethren. 
because you've done well. You grow in confidence because you had an experience with God. You took it from the ethereal, which is heaven, and brought it right here in a practical world. God doesn't want us in any context to be walking around feeling guilty about anything that goes wrong in our lives. He doesn't want us to just be praying and say, God, forgive me, da, da, da. He doesn't want us to do any of that kind of stuff. God wants us to be mature. God wants us to be clear about who he is, because he's clear about who we are. He knows that we were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. So he knows things are going to go wrong, but he doesn't want us to live in a place where things are wrong. So with all that, it's a place of just letting go. You're releasing this place of guilt. You're releasing those things that we hid behind. We're releasing the ideas that aren't complete with who we are. When I talk about making this shift, it's really talking about redefining how we pursue God. It's really talking about how we pursue God in everything that we do. Because God gave all of who he is, all of who he has, and he put it inside of us so we can create a greater world. But we can't do two things. You can't have two minds working at the same time. You can't say, I'm going to do my thing until I just discover God thing. Say, I'm going to discover God thing as I'm doing this thing. Because as you begin to do that, as you're walking further with God, he's opening up your spirit. But if you're not seeking God in all that you're doing, there's nothing talk to you about because you're busy doing your own thing and as we're seeking to do what God's calling us to do we begin to start engaging in this powerful fight and what the fight is the fight the good fight of faith that we can lay hold of eternal life eternal life is really the quality of life that God's called for us eternal life is really life way God's intended for us it's the promise of so much more it's the promise of this great experience. And in order to make the shift, we have to begin to start thinking in line with what God is saying. Say, I will hear what the word is saying. I will pursue what God is calling me to. I will become what God made me to. I am God in the flesh. I ask you to do that because God is really trying to talk to us about going beyond what we have done. And when we begin to fight that good fight of faith, we begin to start seeing how we change this world around us. Uh, the world needs more little gods, more little kings, more little leaders functioning in this world. We need examples. We need this generation to wake up and burn a blazing fire. We need this generation to really engage in this fight of faith to really begin to see the kingdom of God alive in the lives of men. It's so necessary. It is, it's, I think it's a shame that we don't teach about the kingdom of God in church context because it's a life message. It's a life message. It's how we build our homes. So when we as young people, as you're, you're dreaming about the future, uh, whatever careers you want, whatever families you want to have, it's so important that if you can take the time to understand, I build that through the kingdom of God. I build that with the kingdom of God. Because those are the answers to how you begin to build effective relationships. Those are, those are the paths and how you go to about to be making decisions that God is making for us. It's really a, a critical journey. If we just go for one more piece. It's one of those things that um, if we can arise above the challenges that we've had. Um, I was looking at a story that it happened in uh, the States the other day. There was a young lady who was taking a stand before God, um, but she was imposing um, her stand on God. People. She took a very flat footed stand and said she does not want to marry gay people. Um, and it goes outside of what God has been teaching about marriage. So it was a good stand she took. Um, the way she took the stand, the time she took the stand, was the issue. When we respond after a problem happens, we're not moving the way God moves. The way God moves is that he sees the end from the beginning. So he says, if ideas are stirring around in the air about relationships and how they can function, it's only a matter of time before they're gonna to wanna to make sure that this is a part of the way of life. 
because only so long that people play. So we play when we're in the childish areas. Um, as we begin to grow through adolescence and into adulthood, we begin to want to have things that last forever. So instead of moving around from friend to friend, you want to have friends that stay with you. Instead of living with your parents or renting a place, you're going to want to buy a place. You're going to want to make things permanent. So if you wait until things become permanent, it becomes hard. It becomes difficult. The Bible calls them strongholds. They're reinforced ideas. And when you're doing that kind of thing, it becomes a whole difference. The, the Bible talks about the fact that the king, kingdom of God suffered violence. It suffered violence. That means it's a turbulent experience. There's always a place of testing. There's always a place of proving. There's always a challenge for advancement. And as we begin to see that as this young lady went through her time, she was in prison for a good thing. We learned that if we move ahead of things, we can really accomplish what God's calling us to do. So I, I want us to really think critically about the things that are happening, the things that are just uh, songs today, the things that are just small chatters today, the things that might just be an itch in a body or a twitch in a hand, a thing that might be just a stigma in a textbook, because that's the seed of tomorrow. Yeah. I hope you get that. Yeah. The same way we have seeds of hope, the camp that we're developing these ideas of God on the side of the positive side, on the kingdom of darkness, there's the very opposite. But a lot of times we let those ideas float too long until it comes to a place where they're gonna pass a bill, they're gonna build an establishment, they're gonna remove God in the schools. They're going to impose uh, negative teaching in the schools. And then we want to engage in the fight. That's not the time to call the action. You can't go to action. But the time to go to action is when the idea was still looming in the spirit. Because you could have just pulled it down. You could have just pulled it down. Say, I, say pull it down. Say pull it down. Say pull it down. Because there's so many things that are floating above us. Um, that needs to be pulled down. There's so many things that are floating around us that needs to be birthed out. And that's why we need to take time to tap into what God is saying and adapt his word of God in us. Because he's speaking expressly to us. He's speaking to us and tell us, make a change in the way that we see our relationship with him. Stop seeing it as a Sunday experience. Stop seeing it as an early morning experience. Stop seeing it as a late night experience. See it as an all day, every day experience. See the kingdom of God is alive and powerful. It cannot be just an idea that's parked away for religious organizations. The kingdom of God is for life. We build our lives with the kingdom of God, through the kingdom of God, for the advancement of the kingdom of God. As businesses and educational organizations, they look to make sure that every year you're advancing their kingdom. The kingdom of God has to be. Because we must be much wiser in this generation. We must be much wiser in this generation. Our response is to make sure that we're getting wise. Wiser means we're able to apply what's happened before to what's going on right now so we can get better results tomorrow. We must be much wiser. So if we see that there was challenges in the way we built our relationships, the way we built our businesses, the way we just generate income, we can begin to start seeing that there's a way we can begin to see how God has intended to be the real. It must be. In this generation, we learn to fight more skillfully. We learn to go beyond what has been. Uh, we learn to uh, define ourselves by lifestyles. I was looking at the fact that millennials um, tend to define themselves by lifestyles, not possessions. It's a powerful thing because um, as we look at the, the old generations, we kind of felt confident about the fact that we arrived and had a driver's license, we arrived and bought a vehicle, we arrived and bought a house, we arrived and whatever we that we defined ourselves by. Once again, the generation is not defining themselves in that context. The generation, they do zip cars, they share cars, they, they use Uber, they, they pull and they get around how they get around. Um, they rent places. They're a little more mobile. And there's nothing wrong with that. It is, it's a powerful thing because it's a different model of living. But 
we're realizing that there's a shift between uh, two generations. Yeah. There, there's a new expression of how we go about living life. Um, we're not fighting to find a life about what the things we've accumulated. We're fighting to live a life where we're not growing with God. Oh my God. That's the fight that we're in, is how can we grow to be more like God. Um, millennials are more properly mobile. Previous generations are we're more rooted and settled. Millennials have global networks. Previous generations had uh, closer knit networks. Uh, millennials are open and share details about their life free. Sometimes too free. Yeah. Uh, previous generations were more private and discreet with their details. We begin to start realizing that if we're going to go forward with God, we have to take a different approach to how we're going to live with God. In order for us to shift ahead, we have to embrace the message of the kingdom, which is really just to have dominion. We have to begin to grow in God's governance, uh, begin to release more of his influence of his kingship over the territories of our hearts, minds, and affairs of every areas of our lives. We have to look to see how he can impact with his will in our decision making. We have to make sure that his purpose and his intent is what we are pursuing in all things. We have to make sure that we're producing a citizen where people that we know are growing in the influence of God, that we're making critical decisions for God. It's a critical thing that we begin to just uh, pull away from what's comfortable and do what's uncomfortable. There's a saying that I've heard many times, it says, being comfortable, being uncomfortable. It's a hard thing to do because we find comfort and comfort in what we've grown confident in. But when God is saying, behold, I do a new thing, and old things are pass away, all things become new, we get excited because we're looking forward to be new. But the process of that, the process of that, the process of that, that can be difficult. That can be painful. That can separate you from the thing that you built your life on beforehand. Revelation 9, 20, 21 says, The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorcery or their sexual immorality or their thefts. God really wants us to get a place where we're comfortable repenting. Not saying sorry. Not being guilty. A lot of times we say sorry and we're still living the same way we're living before. To say sorry or repent is to change our ideas. To change our intents. To change our behaviors. It's a whole new philosophy now. So if you did something wrong, so you're now falling into fornication, you're now stealing, you're now uh, lying, whatever it is you're doing, it's to go and sin no more. What that means is that as you repent, you change the way you're thinking about that situation so you can live a better life. Repent means that we're going to create change internally, so externally when we behave, when we speak, there's a change in outcome. As we go through life, there's so much ups and downs. And those are good because it forces us to experience the fact that we're going to develop through ups and downs. But as we're going through them, it's so important for us to be awake to the fact that God is speaking to us in the still, small voice, beckoning us to make change. He keeps saying, Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. He says, Change the way we think about Him. Change the way we think about ourselves. Change the way we think about life. Change the way we think about love. Change the way we think about our relationships. Change the way we think about work. The kingdom of God must be involved and influence everything we're going to do. And for us to do that, we need to change the way that we think. Say change. Change. The way, the way you think. Let's the person next to you say change. The way, the way you think. Yeah. So did you hear that? So did you hear that? Yeah. God, God wants you 
to change the way you think. He wants you to think like he thinks. 